Hello and welcome to our webinar, HPA Access, Cortisol and Depression, hosted by Power to Practice with very special guest, Dr. James Wilson. For those joining us that are not yet familiar, Power to Practice is a practice performance system built specifically for functional and integrative medicine practitioners. Our system includes a fully functional EMR, practice management and clinical support tools, as well as an intuitive patient portal. Our goal is to save you time, increase staff productivity, boost patient engagement, engagement and increase your profit. Power to Practice offers unique features that can help make integrative medicine easier for practitioners, staff, and patients. From integration with specialty labs such as Genova, Spectracell, and ZRT, to saving and ordering custom compounds from your favorite compounding pharmacies, we help providers optimize the time they have with patients. We also provide a front office solution to help your staff schedule appointments, manage billing, assign tasks and alerts, as well as oversee your inventory. The patient portal helps you engage with your patients outside of the office and provides an integrated specific questionnaire, medication dosing, and refill reminders, and access to lab results at your discretion. And that's only the beginning of what Power to Practice offers to help integrative and functional medicine practices thrive. After the webinar, please check your inbox. You'll be receiving an email invitation to schedule a quick online demo with a Power to Practice specialist who can answer all of your specific questions about our system. Now on to today's presentation. This afternoon's speaker, Dr. James Wilson, received his PhD in human nutrition from the University of Arizona with minors in immunology, microbiology, pharmacology, and toxicology, and research in cellular immunology. His doctorates in chiropractic medicine and the naturopathic medicine are from the Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College and the Ontario College of Naturopathic Medicine. As one of the 14 founding members of CCNM, now the largest naturopathic college in the world, Dr. Wilson has long been on the forefront of alternative medicine. For over 25 years, he was in private practice in Canada and the United States. In 1998, Dr. Wilson coined the term adrenal fatigue to identify below optimal adrenal function resulting from stress and distinguish it from Addison's disease. With a researcher's grasp of science and a clinician's understanding of its human impact, Dr. Wilson has helped many physicians understand the physiology behind and treatment of various health conditions. He is acknowledged as an expert on alternative medicine, especially in the area of stress and adrenal function. Dr. Wilson is a respected and sought after lecturer and consultant in the medical and alternative healthcare communities in the United States and abroad. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing you all to Dr. Wilson. Thank you, Kristen, and it's a pleasure to be with all of you today. You know, P2P is one of my favorite groups to speak to because you are the docs really doing it. You're the docs that get the comprehensiveness of what to do and, and truly uh, complementary and alternative medicine. So it's a real pleasure to spend my time with you today. We're going to talk about a topic that well, most people haven't heard of or don't realize, and that's a very important role of the HPA axis, including cortisol and depression. Now, What's the purpose of this presentation? Well, it's got five. Uh, first, I want to do some important facts about depression just to get us up to speed, and then help you understand the frequent but often overlooked role of the HPA axis, particularly the cortisol levels in different di types of depression. And the reason I want to bring this forward is because a lot of doctors, even in institutionalized patients, don't even look at the HPA axis when someone's being hospitalized for depression, if you can believe it. Second or third, I want to help the uh, uh, you practitioners become aware of the differences between the HPA axis patterns of different depressive disorders and the types of depression more commonly seen in your practice. So that, in other words, the major depressive disorders are more rare, but there's many more common types of depression you will see in your office. We'll go over the differences in that in the HPA axis. Next is provide an organized method for treating these people, not just the depression, not just do Band-Aid treatment, but have a comprehensive program that leads them not only out of the depression, but to better quality of life. And next, to provide treatment recommendations for those people suffering from depression related to balancing the HPA axis and get rid of that HPA axis dysfunction. So let's look at some depression data. Um, it's a little depressing. Depression is a common mental disorder, and this is by WHO, 
Globally, more than 300 million people of all ages suffer from depression. That's a lot of people. And not only, only, not only that, the impact, it's common. It's the leading common uh, cause of disability worldwide. The leading cause of disability worldwide. So one of the problems we have now, as we're becoming more successful with cardiovascular disease and cancer and hypertension, Tension, diabetes and other kinds of uh, illnesses, then we're also having those people live longer lives, but a, a fairly high percentage of those people also suffer from depression. And so we're having to deal with that in addition to their disease too. So the, the condition is actually growing. Depression can become chronic or recurrent, lead to substantial impairments, and the ability of someone to function or take care of their everyday responsibilities. It can even lead to suicide. And unfortunately, there's about 850,000 suicides around the world each year because of depression. And unfortunately, understanding the molecular biology of depression has been extremely slow, extremely slow. It's not being uh, looked at from a, a molecular uh, as a physiological, as a hormone balance issue for the most part. Now, you might notice some of you heard me talk before. I'm a little bit proggy today, but uh, that's okay. I think uh, if I can just push through this, just a little bit hoarse, and uh, we should be able to get through just fine. Just if you didn't recognize me, it's still me. Now, what about, we talked about in the world, but what about depression in the U.S.? Well, overall, we have about 16 million people uh, as adults that have this. And then we, uh, that ends up being about 6.7% of the adult population. Now, this is all depressions. Uh, females are about twice as much as males. The age it is highest among 18 to 25 year olds. And that's a 10%. So you can see that's even higher than the females. But when we break this down and we look at uh, kids 20, 12 to 17 years old, the frequency goes from less frequent on the 12 year olds down to about, <clears throat> to, to the ones that are about 17 are the most, 17%, 17%, so about one in six young people are suffering from depression. And you notice uh, right above it, the females are about three times as likely as males to be depressed when they're uh, older teenagers. So we definitely have to look at teens because these teens can go on to commit suicide, especially if they don't have any support. Let's look at the definition of depression. And unfortunately, there's still not great agreement about this. So let's look at some what some of people said. And these are all quotes. Depression is a common mental disorder that presents with depressed mood, loss of interest or pleasure, feeling of guilt, or low self-worth, disturbed sleep or appetite, low energy, and poor concentration. These problems can become chronic or recurrent and lead to substantial impairments in an individual's ability to take care of his or her daily responsibility. That's the WHO definition. Another definition, depression remains either, neither a clearly articulated nor a universally accepted category and subtypes have shifted over time. There is no unified understanding of what the category seeks to define, agreed causes, or treatment approaches. That gives you confidence, doesn't it? Or another third quote by Settler, depression is heterogeneous illness that manifests a variety of symptom sets for a variety of reasons at various points in life, lasting for a varying amount of time, and may or may not respond to treatment. My translation, we don't know what it is or how to treat it. So the unfortunate thing is most of these definitions are made by psychiatrists or psychologists. They don't involve alternative medicine or docs like us because we could probably give a more precise definition. But this is the spousal. This is the dilemma that the psychologists and psychiatrists still in. They still don't even know and have a, a precise definition. And even when we get to the worst types, uh, that, that's true. We'll find out about that later. Now you'll have as one of your handouts, the Hamilton scale for depression. And this is a set of 21 questions you give verbally to your patients. Uh, it, do you suspect suffering from depression? 
And we'll get into this, how to view this later, but this is a standard rating scale for an initial uh, evaluation for depression that's used in, in clinical offices through, throughout the United States. And of course, then the classic manual for diagnosis of depression is the DSM-5. And the DSM-5 is, is uh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the fifth edition, uh, published by the American Psychiatric Association. And if you want a wonderful sleeping pill, just read the first uh, 100 pages of the, the part that talks about depression. It's, it's a very uh, convoluted, non-clear, uh, typical psychiatric writing. And, and, uh, but this is where, this is considered to be the Bible for diagnosing depression. There's a wide variety of symptoms of depression and signs of depression. And they may include some, but not many, but many, uh, maybe more than this. Difficulty concentrating. And once again, this is from the, this is from uh, WHO and National Institute of Mental Health, I should say, and IMH. Difficulty concentrating. Difficulty remembering details, making decisions, fatigue, decreased energy, feelings of guilt, worthlessness, and helplessness, feelings of hopelessness or pessimism, insomnia, early morning wakefulness or excessive sleeping, irritability, uh, loss, sorry about the repeat, loss of interest in activities, uh, loss of pleasurable activities, including sex, overeating or undereating, persistent headaches, pains, cramps, digestive problems, Persistent sadness, anxiousness, empty feelings, thoughts of suicide, suicide attempts. You've, you've all seen some of these, and they don't all have to be there. So about 30 years ago, they started classifying the major classifications of depression, and they came up with three. The most severe forms are the ones they considered, the ones that typically that back then were institutionalized. And the first one was melancholic depression. And that composed 25 to 30%. You're gonna see other statistics that say between 30 and 65% with the major depressive disorder called melancholic depression. And then there was a second one that they discovered that's called atypical depression. And the reason they called it atypical is because it was obviously depression, but it didn't meet the criteria for melancholic depression. And then they realized that, geez, you know, there are a lot of people that didn't really meet either one of these. So they created a third one called undifferentiated or mixed. And that ends up being half to more, more than half of patients with my, uh, major depressive disorders. And they did find, so the majority of the people have a mixed type, neither melancholic nor atypical, but, but in between. And they did find that those with a pure melancholic or atypical to fish, uh, feature had a poor prognosis than the mixed. Now, some of the features of melancholic depression, and you're going to hear arguments near hatchet fights over whether certain symptoms are included or not with melancholic and, and atypical depression. But adahenia sometimes is pronounced, uh, pronounced ahedonia, a lack of enjoyment, a flatness. It's just a flatness. A lack of reactivity to pleasurable stimuli, loss of, of uh, three of the following, loss of appetite or loss of weight, insomnia, psychomotor retardation, sense of guilt, early awakening, depression, worse in the morning, and distinct quality of depressed mood, whatever that is. That's, a, that's a, definitely a subjective uh, assessment. Also, they can have physiologic hyperarousal uh, that's uh, they, they equate it with hypercortisol insomnia. Well, we'll see later why they would. And then another constant feature of melancholy is a diurnal variation with the severity of the depressed mood greatest in the morning. And those of you who know the cortisol diurnal pattern are fairly familiar with this. And maybe lights going off on you thinking, early morning depression. Atypical has more mood reactivity there. So in other words, if you do something, some of these people, a greater portion of these people will actually brighten to someone saying, good morning, rather than the person with a melancholic just kind of non be a blob. They'll have an increased appetite, weight gain, tend to excessive sleeping. They have a kind of a leaden paralysis and they'll be hypersensitive. They'll be hypersensitive to interpersonal rejection. So 
you walk in and you say, good morning. They go, why'd you say that? Why'd you say that like that? Is it you don't like me? So you can see that where the melancholic doesn't have that. And that's not always, but it's common with atypical. Uh, atypical is more common in women. It's associated with an earlier age of on onset. It frequently includes comorbid anxiety and, and has the avoidant personality disorder. So they become asocial and they withdraw. Uh, not to the point of a of a catatonic schizophrenic, but they just are non-social. They also have more tendency to have suicide thoughts or attempts and greater utilization of health services. They have physical and sexual abuse or neglect problems more than the uh, by the melancholic or, or mixed. And they also have functional disabilities, the ability to dress themselves, feed themselves, clothe themselves, look after themselves. They respond better to MAOs than tricyclics, and they may have a smaller noradrenergic act, 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 activation. Uh, so in other words, they, they won't be, le they'll be less accurate on the recall of emotional memories with time than melancholics. Now the quote, through the diagnostic criteria, though the, though, I'm sorry, though the diagnostic criteria allow the specification of different subtypes, melancholic and atypical features, a consensus to be reached with regard to the clinical symptoms that clearly de delineate these subtypes. Once again, it's this, they're, they're still dealing with these unclearly defined uh, types of, of uh, mental depression. The majority of people with major depression present with a mixture of cognitive affect and physiological features that do not fully conform to the classifications of melancholic and atypical depression. Moreover, not all cases, the melancholic and atypical depression resemble one another. How'd you like to be a psychologist, psychiatrist, and figure this out? Wouldn't that be fun? <coughs> Sorry about that. Now, let's talk more specifically about depression and the HPA axis. Um, if you don't know a, the HPA axis by now, then I think that you probably ought to change fields. But this is the HPA axis. Uh, depression in the HPA axis, believe it or not, depressed people often have elevated cortisol. So you probably know, okay, you're the adrenal fatigue doc. You talk about low cortisol all the time. Now you're talking about high cortisol. Well, you remember, I also talk about metabolic syndrome and I talk about Christian syndrome. And, and also that the majority of people when you look at psychiatric cases, when they have a major uh, cortisol, and when they have major cortisol, they typically have elevated cortisol levels. It's more common than low. They can have low. Many antidepressants are thought to improve the mood by altering this HPA axis function. Now, abnormalities of the HPA axis have long been implicated in major depressions with hypercortisolemia, reported in typical, which they mean melancholic depression, and hypocortisolemia in some studies of atypical depression. Studies vary widely on the percentage, uh, percentages suffering from each of these two types. They say at least 70%. Uh, it goes up to 85% when you're talking about major depressive disorders involved in the HPA axis, with the primary drivers being signs and symptoms of cortisol, high or low. Now, an important thing, since you docs, most of you are dealing with stress and stress in your patients. Stress precipitates depression. As a matter of fact, when you look at the road to depression and the road to severe stress, you see they have quite a few parallels. Major depression and the stress response share similar phenomena, mediators and circuitries. Thus, many of the features of major depression potentially reflect dysregulation of the stress response. In other words, the HPA axis. Another feature of the HPA axis, just to remind you that there's a negative feedback system on this. So as cortisol typically rises, then the hypothalamus has to, receptors for cortisol in the hypothalamus have to decide how much cortisol is needed for the coming two to three seconds. And then it either up or down regulates how much CRH is given to the a a pituitary for ACTH to be released to go to the cortex of the adrenal, which then adjusts for the cortisol. So this is the way it's supposed to work. Doesn't always work in the depressive syndromes we're going to be talking about. 
The HPA axis is the major endocrine stress axis of the human organism. Cortisol, the final hormone of this axis, affects metabolic, cardiovascular, and central nervous system, both actively, acutely, and chronically. Very important thing. The HPA axis is the major stress axis of the human organism, and cortisol is the major mediator of that HPA axis. So let's look at four different types of hormone patterns. Melancholic, atypical depression, Cushing syndrome, and Addison's disease. So in other words, melancholic and, cu and Cushing's are two elevated cortisol patterns, a uh, atypical depression and Addison's disease being two low cortisol patterns. In melancholic depression, we look at CRH and we have a normal response to CRH. So in other words, when you get a poke from cortisol, CRH probably should shut down a little bit. When cortisol becomes low, CRH increases to stimulate ACTH release. But a, in ACTH response, you had a, blooded, a blunted response. It under responds to CRH in melancholic depression. So you end up, even though you may have an elevated CRH because of low cortisol or high cortisol, the low ACTH is still stimulated, but here's what's really interesting. In a lot of these cases, the adrenal cortex is hyper-responsive. It may have hypertrophied, or the cells may simply be more increased, have increased sensitivity to ACTH receptors. And so the, even though you have a low ACTH output, you have an increased cortisol that goes out into the bloodstream because the uh, the adrenals are especially sensitive to ACTH. As a result, even though CRH, CH, CRH is, is, uh, is normal and ACTH low, cortisol is high in melancholic depression. It's a very interesting pattern. Now with, with an atypical depression, the CRH does not rise proportionally to the, the amount of, of a cortisol. It's kind of flat. It's under-responsive. ACTH is under-responsive to CRH stimulation. And cortisol is under-responsive to ACTH. So you have a flatness in CRH, ACTH, and cortisol responsiveness. This person, the entire HPA axis is depressed in atypical depression. In Cushing syndrome, CRH is normal to decreased. And the reason it's, 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 we say that is because you can typically get a blunt response to cortisol and distress because cortisol is elevated. And so it tries to negate some of that elevated cortisol by blunting the CRH response. In ACTH, if the primary Cushing's disease is being caused from an adrenal adenoma, an adrenal tumor, then ACTH can be suppressed. If it's a secondary cause from a benign pituitary adenoma, of course, with ACTH being produced by the uh, anterior portion of the pituitary, then ACTH is gonna be highly increased and it's gonna be highly responsive to, to CRH stimulation, which means that you have a high amount of ACTH. If it's exogenous Cushing, caused from exog exogenous Cushing's, which are it's uh, idiopathic caused from cortical steroid use, then initially ACTH is low, and then it becomes even lower with time. And the higher the cortical steroid, then the lower the ACTH output. ACTH sometimes doesn't return to normal, but it may eventually return to normal if cortical steroid use is discontinued, especially if it's it's discontinued very slowly over time, or if you get the right kind of support uh, in therapy. With cortisol and Cushing syndrome, of course, it's highly elevated, either from an adrenal adenoma or for a pituitary tumor. If it's from uh, cortisol use, it's somewhat dependent on the amount of cortical steroid. Uh, it's from normal to highly elevated as long as cortical steroids are taken. The difficulty is though, that if cortisol, uh, the corticosteroids are withdrawn to, uh, especially suddenly, to help counter the 
Cushing syndrome it produced, cortisol levels can sink uh, to near zero and can be a medical emergency, and there have been deaths resulting from the sudden withdrawal of corticosteroids in order to compensate for the syndrome caused by the uh, cortisol uh, for the corticosteroids in the first place. This Cushing syndrome, you you've all seen it. I'm going to go over it pretty quickly. We all know about it. These are the classic Cushing syndrome signs and symptoms. Um, so what you may not know is depression is common in Cushing syndrome with about half to over two thirds, three quarters of the Cushing syndrome patients suffer from major depression. So we're not talking about, I don't feel good today. We're talking about a major depressive disorder in half to three quarters or more of Cushing syndrome patients. And it's brought about by the high cortisol levels. In Addison's disease, we have a CRH is normally responsive to stress. In other words, it varies as the stress varies. If cortisol is decreased in Addison's disease, then CRH is normally increased because it's not a negative feedback response. ACTH is normal responsive to CRH stimulation. So if the CRH is elevated, then ACTH is going to be elevated. So it's a, there. You, those two, you have a normal ACT. I'm sorry, you have a normal HPA axis response. But when you get to the adrenals, then you get an extremely low or non-existent levels of cortisol being secreted. The adrenal gland does not produce cortisol due to the absence of function of the adrenal gland tissue in Addison's disease. Remember that Addison's disease is either caused by uh, in pathological autoimmune processes in industrialized nations and infectious uh, diseases like tuberculosis or AIDS in, in uh, non-industrialized nations. But now, unfortunately, the overuse of corticosteroids has become the primary cause of Addison's disease, causing the adrenals to fully shut down and subsequently atrophy from disuse. And I hate to say it, but the, we've caused a number of different Addison's disease crises and, and uh, deaths from our medications. So what do we see in Addison's? Well, you know this pretty well. We have an instruction, if, if it's from a pathological uh, sense, in other words, from an autoimmune or from an infectious state, we'll get an instruction, uh, instruction of the entire gland. But if we get the more common the cortical steroid use shut down, we simply get atrophy of the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland is not destroyed, it's simply atrophied, and there's hope for these people, bringing them back. So what, what we have, some of the typical things that you know of lethargy, but I want uh, lethargy, I want to make sure that you know depression is considered to be typical in Addison's disease. So both in high, pathologically high, and pathologically low, we have depression when cortisol is being under, under secreted or over secreted. Typical Frank Netter uh, illustrator, wasn't he the best medical illustrator in history? And this is his drawing of, of the uh, Addison's disease, of woman with Addison's disease, and all the different features. You're probably familiar with this slide, but it's one of my favorites. He's great. A tremendous loss when he passed away several years ago. Anyway, HPA axis hormones and metabolic syndrome. In metabolic syndrome now, you're going to find the CRH is going to be normal or elevated. It's going to have a normal response to stress. It's also going to have a normal responsiveness to cortisol. So at that point, CRH is functionally as it should be. The hypothalamus is functioning like it's supposed to be with metabolic syndrome. ACTH may be somewhat elevated, maybe due to the CRH stimulation. Cortisol um, is, is elevated using the, the salivary cortisol test is usually elevated during part or all of the day. And at least two of the four uh, cortisol tests are gonna be high during that day, normal, high normal or high. Often all four points are high. Elevated cortisol is, is associated with all major signs and symptoms of metabolic syndrome. Now, what about adrenal fatigue? Well, once again, you have a normal response to, uh, to the hypo, of the hypothalamus, so CRH is normal. You also have a normal response of ACTH. So that means if cortisol is low and, and it's, non, it's, it's not putting out enough for the body, 
then CRH should be a little bit elevated. ACTH should be a little bit elevated, but the adrenals are not, not as responsive as they need to to uh, ACTH. And so you're gonna have low cortisol output. And so on a salivary cortisol test, you're gonna see at least two to four of these uh, cortisol tests during the day are low or low normal, or often all four uh, are close to low or, or in the lows. And, and when you look at the signs and symptoms, especially if you track them during the day, you see they generally correspond with the cortisol levels. So as cortisol levels move lower, signs and symptoms become more prominent as cortisol levels drop. Cortisol levels are related to most depression. So this kind of a summary slide, all altered cortisol levels, either high or low, are seen in all the above health conditions involving depression. Melancholic depression and Cushing syndromes have highly elevated cortisol. So we're not talking about 20%, 30% above normal here. We're talking about five, 10, 20, 30 times the usual cortisol levels in these people. Melancholic, met metabolic syndrome has more mildly elevated cortisol. That's where you get 20, 25, 30, 35% above normal. So it's much more mild elevation in metabolic syndrome than it is in melancholic and Cushing syndrome. Atypical depression and Addison's disease have extremely low cortisol levels. Atypical depression, you have flat CRH, ACTH, and cortisol. Addison's, uh, uh, and with Addison's, you have mainly low cortisol responsiveness. And with adrenal fatigue, you have mildly low cortisol. Either high or low cortisol levels are a consistent finding in most depression, with cortisol named as, the, as a causal or a participating factor by most experts. That's pretty well agreed upon, even though you don't, don't see it practiced very well in the psychiatric clinics or the mental rehabilitation places. So here's a little chart I hope you use that it just summarizes what we've been talking about and shows the differences in the CRH response and the ACTH response and the cortisol response in these different conditions we've been talking about. And if you look at this, I think you're gonna find some help with this because an understanding why this, and, it, and it's not, this is an absolute, these are generally the findings you see and you will find studies that defy each, any of these, uh, because there's so many variables to do this. But this is overall, this is what you'll find and what you can kind of hang your hat on. Now, let's talk about the HP axis and how it's related to adrenal dysfunction in your clinic. Over the last year and a half, maybe two years, there's been this move, and, and I'd say they're mostly among either academicians or people that don't know what the hell they're talking about. And they're saying there's no such thing as adrenal fatigue. And they're saying what we really should call it is HPA axis dysfunction. I don't disagree with that. And I already anticipated this when I designed my supplements over 20 years ago. But let's go back and look and see what kind of evidence. When you look at the evidence they're presenting, they're usually presenting extreme stressful conditions, childhood sexual abuse, early childhood trauma, uh, severe PTSD, uh, Asian orange poisoning, uh, concentration camp survivors. And Sapolsky showed in his experiments that when cortisol is, uh, is uh, elevated, highly elevated suddenly, He's doing this with his primates. When he suddenly injects them with a large amount of cortisol, there's damage to the hippocampus and the hypothalamus. But, but, when he simultaneously injected them with glucose and cortisol, brain damage was avoided. So what's our take home message for this? If that stress is severe enough, so that, cortical, so that cortisol is highly ele elevated faster than glucose can rise, then you're likely to get brain damage. But if glucose can rise in response to the cortisol, and remember, 
Cortisol is a major regulator of glucose. It's responsible for glycogen conversion to glucose. It's responsible for gluconeogenesis. It's responsible for glucose use inside the cell. So glucose is a very important is very important in, mon in modulating the effect of cortisol. And cortisol is one of the major uh, monitors of glucose release and manufacture. So if it can happen slowly enough so we can get glucose elevated while cortisol is, is being elevated, even during times of fairly extreme stress, we're not gonna get the damage to the HPA axis. Now there's another reason why, so take that in consideration and, and know that it's only gonna be in certain extreme situations you're gonna get uh, HPA axis dysfunction that's going to produce hippocampus and hypothalamus, hypothalamic damage. Also, look at the actual clinical evidence. How many studies do you know where they're talking about uh, metabolic syndrome or they're talking about low cortisol states, of which there are many, where at the same, when they're saying there's no such thing as adrenal fatigue, you have a group of patients that have low cortisol and at the same time, they're testing ACTH and they're testing CRH. For one thing, when you test CRH, it's mostly in the hospital, isn't it? You usually have to go in, they administer it, you do the 30, 60, 90, 120 post-injection, you see what, what the response is. That's an expensive process, about five, $600 minimum. ACTH is not an, a usual test at a, a but you can do it. Uh, LabCorp and, and uh, Quest do that. Uh, and so it's very difficult. And cortisol is easily measured, but unfortunately, blood's not nearly as good as salivary or fingertip. Uh, so they're using inaccurate measures. They're not testing CRH for the most part because it's too expensive. So they've got no business trying to postulate that there's no such thing as adrenal fatigue when they don't have a single study that shows that their model of CRH is. is uh, adjusted during times of, of normal stress. So we have we have a single mom who's working two jobs with four kids, and she's a perfect one for us to put under the stress category. We put her in the hospital, and we check CRH, ACTH, and cortisol. You think that's going to be a very uh, well accepted model? No, you're never going to get funding for that. Why? Because at the end, there's no money in it. There's no drug at the end of the rainbow for them to recoup billions of dollars. And so what they're saying is simply speculation. What they're saying is, to the best of our ability, we think that there's some hypothalamic dysfunction. But I will bet you dollars to donuts that they've never done an actual double-blind study. And of course, that's their favorite study, which I think is a flawed uh, study. They've never done the study to show the CRH is elevated or depressed, the ACTH is elevated or depressed, and the cortisol is elevated or depressed in these stressed people that you see most of the time in your clinic. And from my 25, now 40 years of experience, what you're gonna see in your clinic is a different story than what they're pontificating in their HPA, HPA dysfunction. Now, let's look at the clinical relevance of major depressive disorder. Um, so I was a psychologist before I was a doc, and, and uh, well, I guess they're both docs, but anyway, before I was in, in, in active practice pre, uh, with alternative medicine. I saw over 100,000 patient visits, and I only saw two cases of major depressive disorder. Uh, if you have a patient presenting with classical symptoms of major depressive disorder, I think it's better for you to refer them to a specialist that deals with a specialized depression that will work with you, not take them away and you never see them again, but work with you. And then you can work on the comprehensive treatment. They can work with their specific uh, drugs or whatever they wanna use when modifying the therapy. And you work together to try to help these people because they're gonna ignore the HPA axis most likely. They're gonna give them strong drugs if you don't watch them. And, and you need to have your input in helping with their diet. And who knows? I had a woman who was sensitive to wheat and uh, her, her brother stole her out of a mental institution and took her into a cabin up in the woods of Colorado, uh, handcuffed her to a bed for seven days, and her hallucinations disappeared. Her all of her uh, uh, 
signs of psychosis disappeared and it ended up she had a severe allergy to wheat. And after that, and he got her on a, 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 a diet that was without wheat and she was totally fine. Now the patient I had had sincere, uh, a very strong allergy to dairy and she didn't show up for an appointment. And when I went over to see her and find out why she didn't show up for an appointment, she looked up and I shook her, Sandy, 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 finally got her wake. Is, is that you, doc, is that you? Yeah, Sandy, you've been drinking milk? I don't know, I think so. I looked in her kitchen wastebasket. There were two quarts of milk in there. Once again, we got into an orthomolecular program in, in Vancouver. She straightened out and, and she was fine without all the drugs and without all the institutionalization. But her primary trigger was dairy. And she'd been through shock treatments and all kinds of other things with the medical field. So although I seldom saw, saw major depressive disorders, I saw milder types of depression in my clinic all the time. And when I started treating them in a comprehensive type of, of, uh, of treatment program, doing a comprehensive intake interview, uh, a clinical examination, and doing the right laboratory test, all of a sudden I got this success rates that people weren't, people weren't getting. I had a, a Harvard psychiatrist call a pharmacist and wanted to know what the hell I was doing because he said my patients were getting better than any he'd ever seen before and all I was doing was putting him on the adrenal fatigue protocol for the most part. He said he didn't want to talk to me directly but he wanted to know he knew the pharmacist knew me so he asked me. We want to treat the patient, not the illness, don't we? As, as doctors of comprehensive medicine, we're going to treat this patient. The depression didn't walk into your office. A patient with depression walked into your office. And so we're going to treat this depression as part of what's going on with this person. It's going to give us clues to what's out of balance in the patient. So we establish this, reestablish this balance, and then the depression goes away. Same with cancer. I never treated cancer, but I had a lot of patients with cancer. I treated the patient, and the cancer didn't want to live there anymore, so the patient found another home or did something. It went away, and the patient got better. So what we're after is creating homeostasis back in this patient. So even though we're going we're gonna to look at the depression, we're going to make sure we target it as part of a treatment protocol. The whole thing is to bring about a healthy, healthy, balanced person. We treat the dog not the tail. We don't run around trying to find a Band-Aid to put on each and every sign and symptom. We treat the whole organism to bring back homeostasis and, and wholeness in that person. We treat the patient, not the illness. So we use depression to get a more complete understanding of the person so we can treat that person as deeply as possible, keeping in mind that we need to do more to make them as comfortable as possible on the road back to balance and health. We also treat the depression. We don't ignore that, but we treat the whole person. To help patients with this kind of depression, most likely seen in your clinic, it's important to be able to recognize, diagnose, and treat these high and low cortisol conditions. And you're gonna see most of these people have either metabolic syndrome or adrenal fatigue. Signs and symptoms of mild depression are commonly seen in both the high and low cortisol symptom of adrenal fatigue and metabolic syndrome. Therefore, when a patient has low cortisol as adrenal fatigue or high cortisol as a metabolic syndrome, look for signs and symptoms of depression. Look for that sense of helplessness, hopelessness, uselessness. If uh, you want to bring out the Hamilton scale, read the Hamilton scale to them and get an idea of how severe it is. If you're getting more than six answers uh, in the 21 questions, you probably need to think about referring them to a professional who specializes in depression. And also, when someone comes in, they plop on your couch and say, or your, your desk and say, God, doc, I'm really depressed. One of the first things you want to do is do a hormone analysis. And of course, if you're going to do uh, the blood spot or you're going to do the uh, saliva test, we're going to make sure we look at estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHEAS, and, and, adrenal, uh, and adrenal function because we don't want any surprises. We're also going to look at thyroid function. We don't have time to talk about that much.
in all cases of depression. If a patient is depressed, always look to physiological imbalance that could be contributed to causal factors. And it's certainly not the only reason why people are depressed. Someone comes in and just says, I'm depressed, and you learn their wife died two weeks ago, there's very good reason for the depression. And you mainly probably just need to give them something that's going to help take off the edge of that depression, and they'll be fine. But if they've been dealing with off and on for years or months, and you're, uh, you ha they have symptoms of metabolic syndrome or adrenal fatigue, for sure, we're going to want to check out their labs and make sure that we can do what we can to help them. We've talked about the Hamilton rating scale, and you should have a copy of that in your handout. If the responses confirm your suspicions, then refer them to someone that can help them. Diagnosing high and low cortisol conditions, the ones you're going to be seeing in your office. Now, remember the, uh, the cortisol type rope walk. Some of you heard my whole two hour lecture on this, but if you haven't, remember that stress usually leads to excess cortisol secretion by the adrenals. And that, of course, because of gluconeogenesis, leads us to increased glucose. And that then increases insulin. And with time, that leads to increased insulin resistance. And with that, then it starts accumulating and becomes part of metabolic syndrome or syndrome X. Or we have another model that stress can lead to excess cortisol but then that excess cortisol wears out the adrenal glands and then they go down to low cortisol output and that produces the adrenal fatigue or functional hypoadrenia. So if the adrenals are strong and they're able to persist through, they'll stay with a metabolic syndrome and they'll be able to go, 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 go while they gain weight, while their blood pressure increases, while their insulin resistance goes. They'll be able to go, go, go. If the adrenals aren't quite that strong, and they start breaking with the stress, then they'll go from high cortisol to low cortisol and they'll get into adrenal fatigue. And then you've got other people that are weaker uh, uh, cortisol, weaker adrenals, sometimes from birth, sometimes from injury, sometimes from stress, previous stresses. They just add a little stress and all of a sudden the cortisol goes down because the adrenals can't hold much stress. And that's when those people get into adrenal fatigue. So those are the three different models that I see, that I saw clinically, the most common in my practice. Now, you take them into your office and you start the ex initial examination. One of the nice things about this is when we're looking at uh, someone that uh, came in for depression or, or for other reasons, if we see indicators of metabolic syndrome or adrenal fatigue, then we want to add those factors to our initial examination. Won't take but about an extra five minutes, but it's going to give us great clues about getting down to treating the dog, not the tail. First, let's look at the diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. So Ravens, as you know, in 88, came up with this definition and, and, and named it uh, Syndrome X or metabolic syndrome. And he saw insulin resistance and glucose intolerance, which is elevated or erratic levels of glucose with insulin resistance. Excess body fat, especially the uh, abdominal adiposity. Elevated total cholesterol over 240 milligrams per deciliter with elevated triglycerides of over 160 milligrams per deciliter with a low uh, HDL of less than 40 milligrams per deciliter. And also high blood pressure, and he'd find that as greater than 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. Current definition is a little bit different. You know, everybody got in the act. You know, there's about four different major uh, organizations that fought over this definition until they finally decided about it in the in the uh, early 2000s. Now we have a glucose intolerance of glucose over 99 milligrams per deciliter. We're going to talk about that. Visceral obesity with a body mass index of over 30, and that's 23 for Asians with a waist circumference over 100 centimeters, which is approximately 40 inches for males, or 87.5 centimeters over 35 inches for females. And then the waist to hip ratio, uh, greater or less than uh, one for men and 0.8 for women. Hypertension, uh, greater than 140 over 90. If, if it's a single indicator, if there are other indicators of metabolic syndrome, then 
over uh, 130 over 80 is an indicator. Dyslipidemia, men over uh, HDL over, we want it to be greater than 40 milliliters per deciliter and women uh, over, uh, over 50. Uh, inflammation, oh, uh, LDL cholesterols, we want to be less than 200 milligrams. If it's over, then that's an indicator. CRP, if it's greater than two, then we're concerned. And note the above test need to be repeated. If you get one single reading, and I've seen this over and over, one single reading, and they say, well, you have this diagnosis. No, no, no. This should be repeated over about a three-month period before you confirm that, indeed, this is metabolic syndrome. You can certainly give them the, the indication, uh, and you can start them on a program, but to give you a definitive diagnosis, you have to put on a, uh, uh, ICD-10. That you want to repeat the test before you give confirmed diagnosis on it. So what are the consequences of metabolic syndrome? If you don't know, you've been sleeping for the past 10 years. Diet, diabetes, adult onset diabetes mellitus, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, depression, hormone irregularities, and cancer. Not a very good, not a very good prognosis. But major depression is associated with a fourfold increase for premature death largely accounted for by cardiovascular disease. The relationship between depression and cardiovascular disease is thought to be mediated by the so-called metabolic syndrome. Epidemiological studies have consistently demonstrated a co-occurrence of depression with metabolic syndrome components like visceral obesity, dyslipidemia, insulin resistance, and hypertension. Not my words, other people's words. Now, what about the central role of cortisol in metabolic syndrome? Increased cortisol is a strong contributor to glucose intolerance, insulin resistance, visceral obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and microalbuminuria. The very thing that we were talking about that was killing people in metabolic syndrome. And we'll take it even further. When we take a special kind of mouse that they're normally obese and we give them a knockout gene that they normally have high cortisol and they also have uh, all the symptoms of metabolic syndrome. When you give them that knockout gene that helps uh, um, 11 beta hydroxysteroid uh, dehydrogenase 2 and they make them normal cortisol output, then those mice had lower body weight, lower insulin levels, less insulin resistance, better, better insulin resistance, I should say, fasting glucose, low, lower triglycerides, lower cholesterol, and, pardon me, lower fasting uh, glucose, insulin, glucagon, triglycerides, and free fatty acids, as well as improved glucose tolerance. In other words, they became normal. These results show excess glucocorticoids produce both central obesity and diabetes, and it's primarily responsible for most of the signs and symptoms you see with metabolic syndrome. Therefore, controlling cortisol is often a key factor in normalizing the physiology and controlling, limiting, and reversing metabolic syndrome, and it's being ignored by medicine, and that's why we don't want to do it. And this disorder spawns symptoms and signs such as depression, insulin resistance, full-blown diabetes, hypertension, and diabetes. You're gonna save lives if you apply what you learned today. The initial examination, what do you wanna do in the initial examination? Your initial examination starts when, you, when they walk through the door. What's their face tell you? Is it round? Is it kind of moon-faced? Uh, do they have a buffalo hump? Do they have uh, excess around their, their middle? Uh, what's their shoulders like? Are they forward? Are they back? What's their posture like? What's their body tell you? What what kind of uh, what kind of confidence do they have when you shake hands? Is it like a wet fish or is it nice and firm? You're looking at them all the time. What's their body telling you? What's the body telling you? What's their face telling you? What's your eyes telling you? When they walk in the door, does his or her stomach precede them? 
Do they have an apple type of body? Do they have their own spare tire? But sometimes metabolic syndrome is not always, all, always obvious. You don't always have the apple type body or that abdominal adiposity. Most of the time, but about 10%, metabolic syndrome doesn't show like that. So you need to do the other stuff. Now, there are some general symptoms of metabolic syndrome, even though we rely more on, them, on, the, in, on the other indicators. So metabolic syndrome people often have unexplained fatigue, brain fogginess, inability to focus, intestinal bloating, gas, sleepiness, depression independent of depressive events, and erectile dysfunction. And you remember what Mark Scalson, uh, Houston said, if there is erectile dysfunction, there's endothelial dysfunction. Now, what are we going to do to diagnose metabolic syndrome? I'm really excited about this because uh, you can do most of this in your office, and all you need is a few simple tools and some simple laboratory tests. So what do you need? Uh, you need a $650,000 scanner. No, 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 you don't. You need a cloth tape measure, about a buck and a half at Joanne's Fabrics or one of the fabric stores, hardware stores. You need a scale, and I, get, I would recommend you get one that goes up to 350 or 400 pounds, because once you become known for what you're doing with people, you're going to get the kind of people that weigh that much. You know, you're going to need a SFIG, you know, a glucose monitoring device, any kind of glucometer is going to work. You're going to need a urinary multi-sticks with a glucose on it, uh, get the 10, the, the Johnson Johnson uh, 10 keto, the 10 urinary uh, uh, sticks that measures 10 different urine uh, tests in, in one stick. The activity and diet info sheet, which is another handout, it'll, it'll be labeled salivary cortisol test daily information sheet, but you're gonna have them fill it out on the day that they take the, uh, the salivary cortisol test. Now, with your cloth measuring tape and your scales, you're gonna do a body mass index, you're gonna do a waist measurement, you're gonna be a, uh, have a waist hip ratio, most of you are already familiar with this. I just want to bring out that Asians can't be considered the same as non-Asians because Asians can be within our normal limits and have metabolic syndrome. And look at this. So for the BMI, anything over 21 in Asians of either sex is considered to be overweight. And obesity in Asians is a BMI of only 23, whereas our, uh, the non-Asians is, is 30 or greater. Um, same thing, we, uh, you, know, you, you know most of this. Uh, resting BP, uh, we've already gone over this. What labs are we going to do? Well, one of the most valuable ones you're going to do is a four-point cortisol test. You're going to take salivary tests done in the morning on waking at noon, late in the afternoon, around 4 o'clock, and then before bedtime. You're going to use that, uh, that daily information sheet that handout, because if you look at it, you'll, you'll see that they want, uh, I've asked for this little thing I, I created in my office. And uh, there's, oh, there's a handout I didn't mention, just a second. Okay, so there's a salivary cortisol daily information sheet that's a handout, and they're gonna list everything that goes in their body, everything they eat and drink uh, during one day. During the day, they're taking the salivary cortisol test, and they're also going to list how they felt, what kind of signs and symptoms they were experiencing, what their day was like. And I created this, this information sheet because I a woman that obviously had adrenal fatigue, but on her four tests, she was low, 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 high. And yet she claimed that she was still experiencing extreme adrenal fatigue during that time at 11 o'clock at night. So I asked her if anything special happened and she says, Oh yeah, about 30 minutes before I test, I, I stubbed my, toast on the, my toe on the bedpost. Well, that elevated her cortisol levels and it gave me a spurious reading on her fourth test. So I created this handout to help all the signs and symptoms plus how they were feeling correlate with their, their uh, metabolic, uh, with, with their salivary cortisol test. Uh, if they're positive on any two of the tests, then the high, then they're gonna be metabolic syndrome. And, what I didn't mention is there's also a, uh, a test, a, a whole sheet that for you use in your clinic that lays out all the tests you do in the clinic for metabolic syndrome that I created for you. And so 
if you'll use that and you, if you'll use that in your clinic, it's a very check this, check this, check this, check this, put these put these different things in for weight, BMI, hip weight ratios, et cetera. It'll make it very, very quick and easy, and you'll automatically know the answers once you measure and do those clinical tests. Um, once again, on the dietary and, and lifestyle analysis, you'll be able to see from that uh, salivary cortisol test and daily information sheet, a lot of these people don't have their first protein until six o'clock at night. They'll get by with a donut in the morning, uh, half a sandwich at noon, and, and then they won't have a meal till six o'clock. It gives you a lot of valuable clues. Then also on that, use it to see how they spend their time, what they're asking for. Um, then one of the ways you can also determine their types of stress is to have them do a good for, good for me, bad for me chart and uh, the health timeline. Now, the good for me, bad for me charts in the book, but all you do is simply have them divide a sheet of paper into two, and on one side, good for me, on the other side, bad for me, and they simply list all the things they love, makes them feel better, is good for them on one side, things that make them feel bad, they're bad for them, or are destructive on the other side. And then they circle the, first, the worst three of each side, and then they prioritize the worst one, twos, and threes. And then they make a plan to how to eliminate the worst ones and how to auxil uh, accelerate and, and get more of the good ones. Then the health timeline is simply drawing a sheet of, a, a line across a sheet of paper. Well, it's a timeline, and they put the dot of where the last time they felt good, and then they start putting other little dots, littler dots, around times when they had high stresses, accidents, injuries, uh, other things that might have contributed to decreased health. And they'll see them clump and they'll see a real pattern there. You also want to look at indication of caffeine consumption, their dietary intake, what their exercise program is. It's a very handy little thing. Now, what I'm going to do as far as blood tests for metabolic syndrome, you're going to look at fasting blood glucose. Now, look at that. We're talking about less than 85 milligrams per deciliter. That's because there have been two studies in the last five years that have shown one uh, with 43,000, the other 46,000 people, that it's not 99 milligrams per deciliter that's, a, that's the breakout point for suspected diabetes. It's 85 milligrams per deciliter on a fasting blood glucose. And for every increase in that milligram per deciliter, there's a 6% increase of developing diabetes mellitus at a later date in their life. So the new set point should be 85 on fasting blood glucose. Postprandial glucose shouldn't rise above 160. Fasting insulin should be um, less than 25 milliunits per liter and, and uh, uh, postprandial 174. Um, the postprandial Insulin, that's, you have a meal, your breakfast usually, uh, you take a baseline before you have breakfast of insulin, and then you have 30, 60, 90, 120, 150 remeasurements. And your key spot is that if any of those readings after the breakfast is more than five times the baseline of insulin that you took before they eat, that's an indicator of insulin resistance. If you need more information on that, I can, uh, you can contact us and I, I, can, I can provide that for you. A total cholesterol, you want under 220. HDL, uh, greater than 40. We, we know all this stuff, so I'm, I'm going to skip this. Positive for metabolic syndrome, if any three of the following. If glucose is, is uh, elevated, uh, if uh, insulin resistance is greater than 25 milliunits per liter, on a fasting, if the excess body fat's greater than 25, waist 40. We, we've gone through this criteria, but if after you get their summaries of, of their metabolic syndrome and you look at them and compare them, and they have more than three of these, then you can be justified in giving them a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome as long as you repeated it at least once and separated it by, say, six weeks or so. Depression is a common finding in metabolic syndrome. And so now we're going to move quickly on to di uh, diagnosis of adrenal fatigue. I'm going to go through this a little bit faster because I'm sure that most of you are familiar with adrenal fatigue. If you're not, then if you want to uh, 
have a separate lecture on adrenal fatigue, just uh, uh, email me and I'll send you one. If the adrenals are destroyed by an infection, of course that's Addison's disease, but most people don't have to deal with Addison's disease. They're mostly people that have this, this dragging around through life, not quite being there, suffering from a lack of energy. These people mostly are suffering from adrenal fatigue, from low adrenals. And what's that mean? Well, it means the adrenals can't function right. They're not functioning at rest or under stress or in sporadic uh, demands for them. When they can't, basically can't keep pace with the demands placed upon them for the stress, that's adrenal fatigue. And ironically, if you want to look at a, a relative adrenal insufficiency, it has the exact same definition. I don't know whether they took it from a book or what, but I was astounded when I read that. Adrenal fatigue is very common, seen daily by your, in your offices, in adults and children, children especially now, with all the stresses they're under. Adrenal fatigue occurs both as a distinct clinical entity and as a contributor to many chronic illnesses. And here's some of the illnesses that you know and you probably own. <clears throat> Basically, any chronic illness for which corticosteroids can be as described or a chronic illness that goes on for more than two years is probably going to have a low adrenal component to it. Thank you, I had to take a quick pause there. Now, especially look at respiratory ailments because there's a special relationship between the adrenals and respiratory illnesses, especially bronchitis and pneumonia. So that as someone has repeated bronchitis and pneumonia, they'll bring the adrenals down. And as the adrenals get weaker, they're more likely to have more frequent bouts of bronchitis and pneumonia or respiratory illnesses, colds, infections. Um, clinical conditions you'll see associated with adrenal fun with low adrenal function is decreased immunity, lack of stamina, emotional paralysis, PTSD, poor wound healing, increased susceptibility to infection. They'll say, I catch, I'm catching everything coming around. Weak cardiac function, and that's both inotrophic and chronotrophic. So that's not only uh, just usual cardi cardiac function, but it's especially in, in uh, uh, cardiovascular events where 50% of the people don't even make it to the hospital. Of those people that make it to the hospital, the people in the lowest quintile have very little chance. As a matter of fact, one study said zero chance of making it through the first 24 hours. Uh, we'll also see a lot of, we're dealing a lot with uh, drug addiction now. Oftentimes, adrenals were low before the people got into drug addiction. And with the drug addiction, the adrenals are pulled down even further. Also, hypoglycemia, uh, because the adrenals, as you know, cortisol is the major regulator for blood glucose. So when they have hypoglycemia, they usually have that. With cortisol being the largest anti-inflammatory in the body, somebody has allergies, environmental sensitivities, chemical intolerances, they usually have some sort of adrenal problem. Um, one of the other things you want to watch for is when, uh, when uh, drugs are prescribed for, uh, high, for low thyroid, but they don't seem to work, look for a low adrenal function. Because remember, the adrenals are necessary for the release of uh, of TSH from the pituitary gland, from converting T4 to T3 in the liver, and then at the receptor sites of the cells, cortisol is necessary for the thyroid uh, hormone to be active. Uh, sexual dysfunction, lack of libido, of course. And if you ever want to, if, if you don't have uh, now, and if you're not treating the adrenals in your perimenopause, menopausal women, start now because your success rate is just about to go way up. Same with PMS. Balance the adrenals, most of the signs of PMS and, and uh, menopausal and, and uh, in, increased uh, women's problems is going to dissipate tremendously. Daily energy patterns are one of your keys, a common sense. One of them is a morning fatigue. 
Uh, usually they wake up, but they don't feel well rested. They don't really wake up until about 10 o'clock. They usually feel much, much better after the noon meal, but then they have a low around two to four, three to five. Uh, it's as slight as just not feeling very energetic to as bad as needing to lay down. Then it's like a magic bullet goes off, a magic switch turns on around six o'clock and they feel better than they felt during the rest of the day. They usually get a little tired around nine or 9.30, but if they push through, they get a second wind. And all of a sudden around 11, they wanna stay up till one or two and do those projects. Then they wanna sleep in late in the morning and they'll find they get their most refreshing sleep between seven and 9 a.m. This is all cortisol related. This is all cortisol related. And when you see this kind of pattern, there's no other fatigue pattern like it. Cortisol is the explanation. And so how do I know? Because I've done things like interrupt these by giving five milligrams of hydrocortisone at 1.30 when they have their afternoon load at two. I've had them take hydrocortisone while they're laying on their bed in the morning before they ever get up and they don't go through the wake taking till 10 o'clock to wake up. It's definitely a low cortisol pattern and you'll see it over and over and over in your practice. Um, you see food cravings, they'll crave salt because the cortisol, remember the cortisol is also a, uh, it, it, it works with uh, aldosterone. And so it's a mineral corticoid. And so when cortisol is low, it's also harder for the body to retain salt. And so they'll want to crave salt to replace the salt that's being peed out. They also crave food high in fat and, and they'll feel better with a high fat, high salt, high caffeine diet. Um, have, we're, one of your handouts here is the adrenal fatigue questionnaire. Keep this as part of your, uh, as your intake interview. Just put it in the three or four pages in, in your intake interview information sheet. They'll fill it out when they're in your office. And then when you go, uh, when they uh, present their paperwork to you, you'll look at it and you'll know in two seconds, ah, I need to look at these person's adrenal. Or no, these person's this person's adrenal is fine. So what are you gonna do to, for a diagnostic test of adrenal fatigue in your office? You need four things. You need the adrenal fatigue questionnaire, a SFIG, a pen light, a watch, and an examination table. The questionnaire provides invaluable information and you can use it every three months or so to see the progress on it. But just know women, uh, men over 26 and women over 20, 32, with well, a total questionnaire of, of those scores have some sort of adrenal problem. Um, and then you can get more into what are the predisposing factors, possible origins, causes. Um, you'll look then symptomatology are divided into key signs and symptoms, energy patterns, frequently observed events, food patterns, aggravating patterns, relieving, relieving patterns. Um, What clinical tests are you gonna do? Take them into your, your examination room. If you can make the light darkened, uh, keep it dark for a couple of minutes then come back into the room and take, a, uh, take your pen light, shine it across their eye, not into their eye, but across their eyes and watch their iris. If you get pupillary contraction like you should, then it should hold. But the people with adrenal fatigue, it's gonna to start to vacillate very quickly and then it's gonna dilate and sometimes around a minute and a half to two minutes, it's actually going to dilate fully, even though you've got the light shining across it. Those are usually the more severe types. Then you lie them down on the on uh, on your uh, examination table, and take their BP uh, line, and then stand them up and immediately take the BP. If it drops by about 10 millimeters of mercury, or even if it stays the same, that's an indication of low adrenal function. It should rise by about 10 millimeters of mercury in order to get the adequate oxygen and, and uh, nutrients to the brain when they rise up. Lie them back on the table and on their back and take a blunt instrument like the blunt, uh, blunt end of your neurological hammer and draw it across their abdomen with about five pounds of pressure. What you should see is a little pink line from your pressure. If you see a white line or a white line with pink outlines, then that's a sign uh, it's a called a Sargent's white line, named after Emile Sargent, a French physician who was an early uh, uh, discoverer of adrenal dysfunction. Then roll them over on their back 
and put your hand put put your thumbs about an inch to the side of the uh, between the eleventh and twelfth uh, uh, ribs, and push in with again about five pounds of pressure. If it's positive, it's a painful for them. That's another sign. That's called Rogoff sign. And Rogoff was one of the first isolators of cortisol uh, in his crude form back in the 1920s. So we have good history uh, behind adrenal fatigue. When they say there's no such thing as, as adrenal fatigue and it has no history, they're absolutely wrong. It was called different things back in those years, but they, physicians noted it over and over and over in their writings. Once again, we're going to do the salivary cortisol test as we did with metabolic syndrome. And uh, we have the same kind of interpretation, except this time, if it's low, uh, two to four times, then, then we're going to have that as an indication of adrenal fatigue, along with a questionnaire, along with the clinical results. So you see, you never just use one indicator. Same with metabolic syndrome. You use your clinical indicators, your signs and symptoms they express to you, then, then your uh, laboratory tests to combine them all to come up with a diagnosis. Same thing with adrenal fatigue, same as you'd approach any other diagnosis. Now, unfortunately, depression is a common finding in adrenal fatigue as well. So other endocrine imbalances that could be involved in depression, low estrogen, low testosterone, low progesterone, low DHEA, low DHEAS, and low thyroid. So don't just get hung up on metabolic syndrome and adrenal fatigue. Uh, it could be one of these others, and your astute use of laboratory tests and your symptom, uh, symptom uh, picture when they do the, uh, the intake interview are going to give you great help. So continue to study and read and, uh, in order to help these people the most. So how are we going to treat these people? We've done a really good job so far of uh, diagnosing them, bringing them in. We've made them feel comfortable. We've assured them that we're going to help them comprehensively, not just going to put a Band-Aid on them and send them home. How are we going to do this? One of the first things we're going to do is we're going to be cognizant not to be the way that metabolic syndrome is usually treated. What's the purpose of the standard, standard medical treatment for metabolic syndrome? Control the symptoms. Of course, that's medicine. Control the symptoms. For the dyslipidemia, they'll prescribe statins. For the hypertensions, antihypertensives. For the elevated blood glucose, they may be lucky enough to get away with metformin, but they'll probably get another blood regulated that's more powerful with more side effects. If they're overweight, then they'll have all kinds of choices. Appetite suppressors, amphetamines, refer them to a dietitian, a given 900 calorie diet, a gastric pan, gastric resections, all kinds of solutions there. And they still have metabolic syndrome, don't they? Now, adrenal fatigue, the standard medical treatment is none. But I've also seen corticosteroids given for them, antidepressants, hypnotics, anti-anxiety medications, amphetamines, and refer them to a psychiatrist. I've also said, had, had doctors say, uh, there's nothing wrong with you. Get out of my office. You're wasting my time. I've had other doctors say, uh, you're a woman, what else do you expect? Just unbelievable insults when they go and they have a perfect syndrome of adrenal fatigue. And when they wanted in my office, we treated them, they got better and they went home happy people. So the nice thing is clinically, when you're using a comprehensive program for these metabolic syndromes and adrenal fatigue, that's gonna probably comprise 60, 70% of the people you're gonna see then you can use about the same, you know, very much of an, of an overlap in the programs you're going to use to help these people. It makes it easy to learn, it makes it easy to use, and your outcomes are going to be great. So in both of these conditions, what are you helping your patients do? Decrease and manage their stress loads. Create a healthy lifestyle. We're going to use the right dietary supplements to reprint replenish these stress depleted nutrients because they're driving themselves into nutritional bankruptcy. We're going to normalize their blood glucose, blood pressure, normalize HPA axis function, especially adrenal function. Restore body, uh, the body to optimal health so the dietary supplements are no longer necessary. Did you hear that? 
we're going to restore the body to optimal health so the dietary supplements are no longer necessary. Because one of the questions you're going to hear, Doc, do I have to take these for the rest of my life? No. At some point, you're going to need fewer and then none of these. That's wonderful. Probably the poorest business model you could be. But it's one of the best things because we want to get people healthy, don't we? That's our whole goal. If you had to quit your practice because there weren't enough sick people, I don't know about you, that put a smile on my face. It would take a year to get off with sucking lemons daily. Uh, now, what are your specific treatment goals for metabolic syndrome? We're going to decrease the cortisol levels to normal. We're going to decrease the cortisol levels to normal. Normalize the adrenal function by making the adrenals not so hyperreactive. We're going to rebalance the HPA axis. We're going to decrease the blood glucose levels to normal. So we're decreasing the blood glucose levels to normal. We're going to reverse the pre-diabetic diabetes situation. We're going to decrease blood pressure to normal. We're going to increase insulin sensitivity, decrease inflammation, normalize uh, lipid levels, normalize weight to within ideal body range, improve the cardiovascular uh, health, and improve the immune function. With adrenal, our specific goals is to increase cortisol levels to normal, normalize adrenal function, and increase capacity to respond to stress, rebalance the HPA axis, normalize blood glucose levels. In this case, most of the time, raising them up because they're too low with adrenals because cortisol is too low. We're going to raise blood pressure because most of the time, blood pressure is too low in those people. We're going to improve their immune function, and we're going to improve their digestion. So... In both these cases, it's going to require some lifestyle changes, lifestyle changes, some regular exercise, some dietary changes, and the correct dietary supplements. It's also going to require commitment on you and your patient's part. So one of the first things you tell them is, Mrs. Jones, this is going to take time. And I'm the doctor that can lead you back to a better state of health than you've ever had. But you're going to have to have your commitment to stay with me. And there's going to be good times and bad times. And you need to stay with me until we get you better. And you need to commi be committed that when the road isn't so smooth and you got to dig into your books or you got to call f uh, a fellow docs, so what's, how can I help Mrs. Jones? you got to be there. Because... In many of these people, you're their last hope. At least that was when I had my practice. So I had, when I closed my, my practice in Canada, I had nearly a, a year's waiting list. And it was not a pleasant scene when I closed that practice because of the patients that felt so lost. But in, in so many of those cases, I was their last resort. Been to 20, 30 doctors before they walked into my office. You've probably got the same situation. You've got those people that they're your, they, you are their last hope. So don't let them down. Take your commitment has to be as much to them as their commitment is to you. And that's one of the reasons I like P2P practitioners, because there's those kind of docs. They're, those kind of docs are going to stay with their patients and not say, well, I don't know what's wrong with you. Go see someone else. You're going to say, I know I don't have the answer right now, and we're having more problems than I thought, but we're going to get to the bottom of this, and you keep going. And I'm always available. You want to call me, there's no charge for my consults. Uh, you want to email me or text me, that's fine. So what kind of lifestyle changes are we going to need for the metabolic syndrome and adrenal fatigue patients? Metabolic syndrome, adrenal fatigue, we're going to have to get rid of the stress overload on both of them. Most of them are going to lack exercise. We've got to get them exercises. We're going to do it differently with metabolic syndrome than adrenal fatigue, but we're going to get them exercising. We're going to improve their quality of sleep. We're going to eliminate the junk foods, and we're going to minimize caffeine ingestion. We're going to minimize the, their stress. More specifically, actively diffuse tensions and stress. Why? Because we want more parasympathetic activity, less sympathetic activity that drives all these stress syndromes. We want them to relax regularly. We want them to do breathing exercises. You'll find them in the book, but there's several breathing exercises. Why? Because it's a parasympathetic enhancer. It gets them out of being so sympathetic dominant. I use them every day. I still use them every day. 
And your patient, many, many hundreds of my patients use them, still use them every day because I hear from them occasionally. We want them to get eight hours of rest, sleep, not just tossing and turning in a bed, but sleeping. Believe it or not, we want to teach them to laugh again. And when I asked, uh, told a patient I wanted her to start laughing, she says, I can't think of a single reason to laugh. We got there. It took a year, but we got there. Because laughing is also another parasympathetic answer. And it's also an important thing to create optimism and to relieve tension. One of the things we want to do is have them not get out of bed until they think of something pleasant. So we want to get them in the habit of thinking something pleasant. Why is this? Because a lot of these, both in metabolic syndrome and fatigue, adrenal fatigue, aren't happy campers. They've got to feel like it's worth getting out of bed. There's something to get them out of bed, not just, I got to be to work in 45 minutes. It's, oh, what's going to happen that's good today? If they can, daily enjoyment for a break, if they can, 15 to 30 minutes. We want to make a part of their exercise program. We want to exercise moderately daily, at least four or five days a week. We're going to do response, relaxation response exercises regularly. We're going to expect something good to happen daily. And then we'll do what I said before, the sheet of paper, good for me, bad for me, and help them choose the most reinvigorating, best things for them to do, and then eliminate the things that are bad for them. We're also going to have them locate the energy robbers. And what are those? Those are the ones that take away your take away your energy. After you talk with them, you feel like you've been washed through a knot pulled through a knot hole backwards. You go, oh man, they just they're, they're real energy suckers. You have to eliminate them. You have to help your patients get rid of them. Um, I also think it's important for you to help them do the reframing techniques. Uh, it's on page 112 of the book. How to shift from it's all bad to it's it's better than I thought. Make a roadmap for the kind of person they want to be. Two or three personal goals that would significantly add quality to their life. So two or three significant goals. So you sometimes you sometimes just do this by before we start. I want you to write down two or three things you want in your life to happen over this next year. And I want you to keep that and post it on a mirror or somewhere you can refer to it often because we're gonna be working toward obtaining those goals in addition to what we're gonna be doing together. The metabolic uh, syndrome, lifestyle changes, slow down. Most of these people are overbooked. We need them to slow down and they get a, a, a balanced life. Interesting article in the Wall Street Journal this week about a woman who was ahead of, of uh, Lehman Brothers. She was a face of Lehman Brothers just before the crash. And she now, and, and she went through a very difficult time afterwards. And she now teaches courses on working, balancing a life between work and home because she found that was what saved her. Um, you find it over and over again. It's getting a balanced life for them, freeing the free, getting up more free time giving them permission to have free time, getting them to enjoy their life, eliminating the obligations, the oddest, goddess, shoulds. It's so heavy. It has such a burden to have oddest and goddess, shoulds. And you want to help them re replace that. So you can't, you can't just get rid of it. They'll replace it with another oughta. So you have them replace it with a wanna. So I, instead of I, I ought to do this, you replace it with, I want to do this. What makes your heart sing? Well, something that brings enjoyment and happiness. Replace that with an auto, God, or should. Want to pu quit pushing themselves with adrenal fatigue. I'm sorry, we switched to adrenal fatigue now. Quit pushing themselves. Some, these people are running on empty, and they'll use every ounce of spare energy to push themselves for their obligations. But we want to quit push themselves. Rest when tired. Balance their life once again. Lie down. During their, don't sit down, lie down during their breaks, 15 to 30 minutes. Get into bed before 10 o'clock. Sleep eight to 10 hours a day. Sleep whenever they can. And sleep in until at least nine o'clock or two hours when they normally would pass, when they normally would get up, whenever they can. If it's only one day a week, it's at least one day a week. 
Now, what about exercise programs? Metabolic syndrome, you got to watch it. A lot of these people are over 20% ideal body weight. They're not really ready to do a lot of exercise. So you got to start with anything they could do. It may take a year to get them before their body is ready to do high intensive interval training. The object is to move them, get them moving. That's the purpose. So we want to get them moving and we're, we're going to, our object here is to decrease the cortisol, decrease the blood glucose, increase insulin sensitivity, decrease the insulin, and decrease the BP. We're going to do this with mild exercise. Have them exercise any kind of sort, any kind of sort. Third, 15 to 30 minutes a day, four to five days a week. Gradually increase their energy output and toning efforts. High energy workouts only at the very end. Not at the beginning, not at the middle, only at the very end. So what if they can, if they think they can take it, you move into it gradually. If they can afford a coach, that's great. If they can, they can do it on their own. Uh, we want to emphasize aerobic type of exercises that lead to greater performance of short duration. So that's what we find that's most effective for people with metabolic syndrome. Each exercise only lasts from a, a few seconds to a maximum of two minutes, like Tabata training, for example. Uh, total workout time, only nine to 18 minutes. We're not gonna push these people. That seems to be the best way to get these people to tone up and to tune up and to lose weight and to get their cardiovascular and, and, uh, all, and the blood glucose and other things back in order the best. Not marathon running. High intensity training, if they're up for it and if they can do it, then you can get into HIIT. I suggest you do it with a coach and with a variety of exercises. I'll leave that up to you, but that's only as a last end. And the reason I say that is because I've seen coaches that they say, okay, what this person needs is an HIIT and a person's 90 pounds overweight. No, 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 no. You wait until they get almost within 20 pounds of ideal body weight before you start into the HIITs. There's plenty of time. What about adrenal fatigue? Any kind of exercises. We want them to, the purpose of this is to get their cortisol levels up. Remember with a metabolic syndrome, the idea was to get their cortisol levels down. Mild exercise increases low cortisol and decreases high cortisol. This will also, we want to normalize their blood glucose levels. In metabolic syndrome, we were going to lower the blood glucose levels with exercise. With adrenal fatigue, we were going to raise blood glucose levels with mild exercise. There's going to be, and we're going to do any kind of exercise, flexibility, anaerobic, aerobics, anything that you could do to get them moving and walking and any, any length of time, whereas we're limiting how much time we're doing with metabolic syndrome, you can do this as long as you want, as long as the patient's not more tired within 60 minutes after they, after they finish their exercises, or they're not more tired the next morning. We also want them to avoid competitive events, whereas metabolic syndrome people, if they want to do competitive events, it's okay. What about dietary protocol? Well, first of all, no matter who they are, no matter what problems they have, whether metabolic syndrome, adrenal fatigue, or any other problem, eliminate the junk foods. Why? Because all they do is steal the nutrients and clog up your arteries and make your heart quit functioning and screw up your body and give you disease. So get rid of them. Just they don't need it in their diet. We survived thousands of years without any of this stuff. We don't need it. Now, this is the pyramid food guide of a lot of people. We have meds on the bottom, followed by beer and pizza, then coffee, and then a McDonald's at the, at the end of the day. So if that's where they come when they, when they start in to your office, that's where you take them from. And then we, fit, we get them into foods, real foods. And how do you know your, their foods? Because they look like they were alive at one point. Get them organically grown. Foods as natural and fresh as possible. Preferably on the lower glycemic index. Uh, we want foods high in omega-3 fatty acids. That'd be wild game, Norwegian sardines, great green left, dark green veggies, ocean fish with low mercury content, shellfish. But food that looks good 
and eventually taste good. Now, people have sugar as a high part of their diet. Natural foods don't taste good. It takes about six weeks before you can develop the taste buds in them. Uh, it just, just know that at first, it doesn't taste good. They have to develop a taste for natural foods. What are we going to do with high meta, uh, with a metabolic syndrome? We want high protein, but mainly white meat and vegetable protein. White meat and vegetable protein. We want low sodium and high potassium diets, which means abundance of veggies, low glycemic index foods, low fat and oil content, low calorie diet. We're going to help these people lose weight that way. With adrenal fatigue, we want a high protein diet. We want some meat at every meal. As a matter of fact, we want to combine a, a protein, a carbohydrate, and a fat at every meal. We'll get into that in a bit. High sodium, high sodium, whereas in metabolic syndrome, we want low sodium. In adrenal fatigue, we want high sodium because we got to replace that sodium that's being lost by the lack of cortisol and the lack of aldosterone. We both, uh, both of these, we need high vegetables, high abundant vegetables, especially the highly colored vegetables, low glycemic index foods. We want high fat and oil content in adrenal fatigue, whereas we want a low fat and oil content with the metabolic syndrome. And there's no caloric restrictions uh, unless the person is overweight with adrenal fatigue. And do you find people overweight in adrenal fatigue? Yes, I've had people over 300 pounds that had severe cases of adrenal fatigue. Now, what dietary tips can I give you? With metabolic syndrome, avoid overeating. Remember, there's about a 15-minute delay in satiety, in the satiety mechanism between being full and feeling full. So if you, if you simply have them, uh, first of all, eat with smaller plates, and then eat when they feel just barely not quite hungry. Wait 15 minutes, and if they're still hungry, have a few bites more. That will help them eat less. Uh, it's also shown if you have soup first, you eat about 20% less if the soup is eaten first. Chew the food. Chew the food 30, 40 times a mouthful. Eat only when hungry because some people just compulse to eat. That's one way they deal with stress. No, wait till you're actually hungry to eat. But then be sure to don't overeat. Don't overeat. Just because you're powerful hungry doesn't mean you need a powerful lot of food in order to satiate that powerful hungriness. Eat small, regular meals, chew the food 30, 40 mouthful, times a mouthful, and avoid food that stimulates insulin or blood sugar. With adrenal fatigue, they got to eat before 10 and again before noon. And we want to make sure they have a, a fat, a protein, and a refined carb unrefined carbohydrate at each one of these meals. We want to avoid fruit in the morning because they're high potassium, low sodium, and we want high sodium, low potassium in the morning and during the day. We want them to be able to add salt. If they have a tendency, if they have desire for salt, add it. There's about 10% of people with adrenal fatigue that do not crave salt. For those people, we don't add salt. But for the most people, add salt. It's not going to be harmful for them. It's going to help them. We also want them to avoid missing meals because we want to keep that blood sugar nice and steady. We want them to eat more or less a metabolic diet. So in, in those cases, we're going to rec replace them with carbo uh, complex carbohydrates, uh, a lot of green leafy vegetables, legumes and nuts, low glycemic whole fruits, um, eggs, fish, olive oil, fats, deep fish, cold uh, deep sea cold water fish, uh, not tuna, but the uh, low mercury fishes, uh, free range poultry, lean meats, and, and no sweets, hardly any no sweets. Now, the people with adrenal fatigue need a lot more lean red meats, and they need overall more protein than the people with metabolic syndrome. What about supplements? They're both gonna require the same supplements in most cases, and I'll point out the differences. Both of them are gonna require super adrenal stress formula. This is a vitamin mineral combination I developed about 20 years ago. Um, it's, a, it's a combination of all the nutrients needed to keep the adrenal cascade flowing and functioning well. And I made it in a sustained release because I wanted a slow release of nutrients, slow release for the B complex so it didn't make people feel jittery, 
and slow release for the trace minerals because there's only certain amounts of, of uh, absorption sites in the small intestine for the trace minerals to be absorbed. And if you have them dumped all at once, you don't get good absorption. So we need high amounts of niacin. Why? Because all the adrenal cascade is NAD or NADPH. And anytime you see that NAD or NADPH reactions, you know it's niacin dependent. We want to find, uh, we, we need a lot of B6, the P5P, because of hydroxylations and transaminations that take place in the, in the, in the adrenal cascade. We need panathenic acid because it precedes a Krebs cycle. It's a part of the acetyl-CoA that precedes a Krebs cycle. We also need the other B vitamins to balance them, but we need them in these ratios. And that's part of the secret of this. It's, it's balanced correctly, it's sustained release, and it's combined with the trace minerals they need to get a proper balance to help stimulate, but not overstimulate the adrenal cascade. This is what it looks like. A lot of you are still familiar with it. And what's its purpose? Well, it has two different purposes. For metabolic syndrome, is to replace the nutrients that are being burned out with a high amount of stress, and, and the, the food simply can't do. You cannot eat enough food to replace the nutrients for the stress that most people are under. For those, the dosage two to three caps a day. Adrenal fatigue, what we're trying to do is not only meet their requirements, but replenish those nutrients have been depleted and also get that adrenal cascade moving better so they can function better. We want to increase that function. We're going to get a better delivery, a better recovery. We're going to increase the stress resilience of these people. As the nutrient starts to build up and the adrenals start to build up their capacity, they'll be more able to handle the stress. Also, as we see this, then the signs and symptoms of adrenal fatigue will also disappear. But they need more. They need three to five capsules a day, depending on their level of adrenal fatigue, which you found out on your adrenal fatigue questionnaire, to, to satisfy the needs for these people. The adrenals burn up and use more C than any other organ or gland or tissue in the body. A lot more. As a matter of fact, before they had a direct measurement for cortisol and adrenal function, they used to use the disappearance of vitamin C from the bloodstreams of animals as an indicator of adrenal stress. And you know all animals can make their own vitamin C except for guinea pigs and humans. So vitamin C is it's a huge, important nutrient to have during any kind of stress. Also, having bioflavonoids is important because ascorbic acid doesn't appear by itself in nature. It's always accompanied by bioflavonoids. I've chosen a two to one ratio here to be with vitamin C because you get a lot better action with the vitamin C and the bioflavonoids have their own actions as well. This vitamin C is pH balanced and it's not balanced with cheap uh, bicarbonates. It's balanced with the trace minerals needed to sequester the free radicals generated by the adrenal cascade when the adrenal hormones are being made. See, adrenal hormones are very essential, but they also create a lot of free radicals. And if you don't have enough the, of the uh, free radical sequesters in there, then the adrenal cortical cascade can slow down and even stop. As a matter of fact, there are two experiments that show that in a, in a Petri dish, using adrenal cortical tissue, you can control the rate of the adrenal cascade by how much vitamin C you use, even though vitamin C is not necessary for anything in the adrenal cascade because it's used to sequester the free radicals. It's also a, a sustained release. Uh, its pH balance is not going to upset your stomach. And the sustained release allows for the slow release because if you just take a bunch of vitamin C, you get the peak valley effect. So you get all this absorption, then it gets dumped out by the kidneys. And so you don't get any net benefit or very little net benefit, not nearly as much as when it's sustained release. And then when you sustain release, then you also get, once again, the use of the trace minerals uh, more adequately absorbed and utilized by the body. This is the adrenal C formula. Purpose in metabolic syndrome is to replace that vitamin C and bio, bioflavonoids and minerals being used up during stress. It also increases the antioxidant activity and decreases that accelerated oxidative damage that stress causes. In, when there's injury, high amounts of vitamin C prevent that cross-fiber scarring that you get in injuries, especially with athletes. 
And so when you combine that with cross friction rub, chances of developing these athletic injuries that sometimes are career ending, uh, career ending are minimized. It also provo uh, provides a constant source of vitamin C to the adrenals, which helps the adrenals regenerate and keep from burning out. Now, the, in adrenal fatigue, we have a different purpose. We want to try to get this adrenal cascade functioning and, and make sure that we have enough antioxidants so this adrenal cas cascade can, can continue to function. It increases the adrenal cascade function, speeds adrenal repair and recovery, provides antioxidants and free radical sequestration for adrenal cell mitochondria and the cytosol. So in other words, in, in the adrenal C, it has magnesium, manganese, uh, copper, and zinc. And that's because on the cytosol, you've got, a, uh, you've got the copper's uh, zinc superoxide dismutase. In the mitochondria, you have the man manganese superoxide dismutase. And the way that uh, the superoxide dismutase regenerates itself when it gets depleted is the mitochondria uh, SOD runs out to the cytosol uses vitamin C and then goes back in regenerated and it can act uh, activate it again. And uh, it does the same thing, vitamin C does the same thing working with niacin with CoQ10. Vitamin C inside the cell regenerates CoQ10. So we're gonna be using all this with C provided these tissues to help recover from stress and adrenal fatigue. But in order to do this, of course, it's gonna take more than it took with metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome, you could keep the vitamin C replaced with two to three caplets. With adrenal fatigue, you've gotta have three to five caplets. Now, what about herbs? Well, we need to rebalance the HPA axis and get it working more optimally if it's, if it's affected. And with metabolic syndrome, we're gonna use herbal HPA, which was ashwagandha, uh, Eleuthero, which is Eleutherococcus cetacosis, and, and maca. With adrenal fatigue, we're going to have the same formula, except we're going to use licorice. And the reason for that is because licorice has a specific to raise cortisol levels, whereas we don't want to raise cortisol levels with, in metabolic syndrome. So that's why we use two different formulas. They're the same, except the herbal adrenal support formula has licorice, and the herbal HPA doesn't have licorice. And here are the two are. So the purpose, purpose of the herbal HPA is to balance the HPA axis function to keep it from going into overdrive, keep it balanced. These are all what they call adaptogens, and that means that they're herbs, and it means that if the function of the organ or gland is too low, it raises it. If it's too high, it lowers it. So these are all three adaptogens in herbal HPA. It helps the patient stay calm and more balanced during the day often will lessen that depression, helps them stay relaxed. Take it at bedtime, helps them sleep more. And for this, you only need 15 to 30 drops two to three times a day. Take one of those at bedtime. With adrenal fatigue, it's gonna help promote the HPA axis balance, increase sensitivity to ACTH in the adrenal cortex. It's gonna increase sensitivity to cortisol in the hypothalamus. It's gonna make the patient feel more balanced, steady and calm during the day often lessens mild depression, increases ability to sleep at night, and helps recover from adrenal fatigue. But for those, you're gonna need 20 to 40 drops three to four times a day, including one at bedtime to help them sleep better. So the combination of taking 40 drops before bedtime with 400 milligrams of magnesium is really well good to help the person with adrenal fatigue sleep during the night. And if that doesn't help, then take a little bit, bit of progesterone cream, whether you're a man or woman, and put it on the wrist or behind the knees or on the, on the temples in order to help sleep better. Now, what else? We're gonna balance that blood sugar with metabolic syndrome because it's elevated, it's, it's re leading to insulin resistance and all kinds of other problems. So we're gonna use a combination of adaptogenic herbs, including bilberry, bitter melon, cinnamon, fenugreek, glugal, gynema, Jambalin, Terracarpus mosupium. And we're all gonna, they're all gonna work together that increase insulin sensitivity, promote normal glucose levels, and provide antioxidant support. There's a lot of research on each one of these herbs, and uh, 
Power to Practice should have this on there. If they don't, we have it on our ICA Health website that shows some of the research, only a, a, a part of it. We have a lot more research we don't have on, on, the, on the web that shows the wonderful, beautiful benefits of these adaptogenic herbs with to help increase insulin sensitivity, lower blood, glu blood glucose, and other things of metabolic syndrome. Uh, in addition, it also contains uh, magnesium citrate, zinc citrate, manganese gluconate, chromium picolinate, and vanadium in order to balance the entire uh, insulin sensitivity and in insulin manufacturer sensitivity at the insulin receptor sites and several other different functions. It's a well thought out and it, it works really well. We even have quite a few onset, uh, adult onset diabetic patients use it to help minimize their insulin resistance and or in their insulin intakes. And in some cases, they've even been able to eliminate the insulin intake, exogenous intake. This is what good sugar looks like. Helps lower elevated blood glucose, increases insulin sensitivity, helps balance those erratic and low blood glucose levels. Another thing it does is it limits the postprandial elevation of blood glucose, which we're finding is more and more one of the damaging things. As blood glucose elevates and insulin elevates after meals, that is uh, one of the most damaging things with uh, elevated insulin and elevated blood glucose. So it helps stabilize insulin in the bloodstream during other times, and it provides strong antioxidant activity, quenching many kinds of free radicals. On these doses, typically one to two on your severe cases, uh, three a day, and you can take one, especially if blood glucose is high at night, take one before bedtime. And uh, if the blood glucose is, is high in the morning, it'll usually be more normal by the time you wake up. This is a metabolic syndrome quartet, you can see. And we're just about ready to come out with another one, uh, that another new product called the Dr. Wilson's cortisol, uh, cortisol stress release, reset. Cortisol stress reset, sorry. <laughs> I named it, but you couldn't think of the name. And, and what this is for is to flatten those elevated cortisol levels and, and to help retrim the, the uh, neurotransmitters that also can become distorted with metabolic syndrome we didn't have a chance to talk about today. We think it's gonna be a very powerful product. And so look forward to P2P having that in the near future, before Christmas for certain. So with adrenal fatigue though, instead of good sugar, we use the key for adrenal, uh, adrenal fatigue recovery is the actual glandular, the uh, adrenal rebuilder. And this is a multi-glandular extract that we've removed the hormones from, and it's, it contains the adrenal cortex, hypothalamus, anterior pituitary, and orchid tissue. We've processed this to remove hormones because what we want is the actual tissue. And this is the key. This is when I started using substances like Adrenal uh, Rebuilder. That's when I started getting my deep recoveries with adrenal fatigue patients. That's when I started seeing the full recovery. That's when I started seeing healing that happened rather than just maintaining them or helping them get 20, 30, 40% better. I was able to get them 100% better to where I now have doctors coming to me and say, you remember I was a poster child for adrenal fatigue? Yeah. And you told me that within two to three years, I wouldn't need these anymore. Yeah, you are right. I'm now doing this, doing this, doing this, and I no longer need the products, but they save me. I love to hear those, love to hear those. If you have stories like that, please let me know. Anyway, this is the metabolic uh, syn uh, syndrome quartet. And you can see here's the HPA axis, adrenal C, super adrenal stress formula and good sugar. Here's the adrenal fatigue quartet protocol. And instead of good sugar, it has adrenal rebuilder. And instead of herbal HPA, it has herbal adrenal support formula. And we also just package this in a box now. So it comes all ready for your, your patients with a lot of information on the inside. So you simply hand it to them because in order to recover from adrenal fatigue, you need all four of those products. And in order to recover from metabolic syndrome to the extent that I like recovery to take place, you need all four of those others. And when the fifth one comes out, I'm so happy. I've been working on this for about eight years and I'm so happy for it to come out too. 
We also have it in, in a desk display if you want to keep it in your office visible. It's, it's a good sales stimulator, uh, depends on the doctor, but we uh, have very good comments about doctor's offices and carrying this in their office for, for the patients to be able to see and handily select. So in summary, the HPA axis, cortisol and depression, has two major classifications in its, when it's severe forms. It has melancholic and atypical types of depression. It also had a third category called mixed. Melancholic depressives usually show high cortisol levels. Atypical show low cortisol levels. Each have their own distinctive HPA axis patterns. There are also other types of depression that involve HPA axis dysregulation. And that dysregulation takes place mo mostly with a dysregulation of cortisol. The most common is metabolic syndrome and the other is adrenal fatigue. So although the practicing physician seldom sees that major classic type of depression that we see a major, ma major metabolic depression, they can often see depression that accompanies metabolic syndrome and adrenal fatigue. And they'll see both of those in their office regularly. Both adrenal fatigue and the metabolic syndrome can be successfully treated by a combination of lifestyle changes, proper nutrition, and the correct dietary supplement and exercise. We have doctors that build their practice just on adrenal fatigue and metabolic syndrome. That's the only two things they treat, and they're busy docs. Both take time. Now, I say one to two years. I've had people who recover from severe adrenal fatigue in less than six months, but the most common it takes one to two years. Metabolic syndrome depends on how severe the, the uh, syndrome is, but typically one to two years, and that's with consistent treatment for a successful outcome. Both can be dramatically affected by you and even reversed with proper treatment. One of the keys is using the correct dietary supplements. You don't want to get these people 10, 20, 30% better. You want to bring them back to their optimal state of health, and that's what I'm dedicated to, providing the supplements that uh, and information that help get these people to optimal health. And during that time as it goes on, then the depression will disappear, but also if you need to specifically treat the depression, please also do that. Thank you for attention. It's wonderful. Uh, I love this group. If you have any questions now, uh, then I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions because my job is is to educate you and to help you with anything, any problem patients you have, anything I can do to help you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilson. Uh, we already do actually have a, several questions for you. So if you don't mind, we'll just jump right into them. Two questions, that's more than I expected. No, a bunch. Okay. Oh, <laughs> we okay. have a bunch. <laughs> okay. uh, the first question, uh, you mentioned a book earlier on in your presentation. Can you just, um, talk about the title and maybe where they can get it? I mentioned two books. Uh, one was a DSM-5, and that's available on, online. It's uh, the Manual for Mental, uh, uh, it's the Manual of Statistical and Mental Disorders, and it's online. Uh, the other was uh, the book, I, I sometimes said the book because it's a book I wrote, and I thought most practitioners would be familiar with it. It's called Adrenal Fatigue, the 21st Century Stress Syndrome. I think P2P carries that book, and if they don't, they can find it on Amazon, or they can find it on our Adrenal Fatigue website, adrenalfatigue.org. Awesome. And then, are your products available in Canada? Yes, they are. Okay, perfect. And then, um, does your adrenal so, feed? Uh, does, oh, I sorry, go ahead. Does, let me ask, does P2P ship to Canada? So we are integrated with Fullscript, um, so that would be the way you could get it through P2P. Okay, so if, if then if they can get it into Canada through Fullscript, then, then that's fine. I just was going to give them an option to get it into Canada if they didn't, so. Oh, okay. Um, and then for your adrenal C supplement, does that use ascorbic acid? No, it's it's ascorbic acid, but it's also with bioflavonoids, and it has uh, four different types of trace minerals. It's also in a sustained release formula. Okay, and then what is the animal source of your glandular product? They're porcine, pork. 
Okay, perfect. And then someone said they love Adrenal Builder. Uh, what would you recommend if antibody is shown as thyroid issues? Antibodies for thyroid. Um, well, first of all, so that wouldn't necessarily be an adrenal problem. Um, I would, first of all, if they're showing antibodies, and I, I'm assuming they're, they're talking about their, uh, their TPO is elevated, their thyroperoxidase is elevated on, and I assume it's a repeated blood test taken three months apart. The most likely is that they either have too much bromine in their diet that would be in breads, or they have uh, not enough iodine in their diet. Now, ZRT does an iodine test. There's other uh, companies that you can have an iodine test done. But usually when I see elevated, uh, mildly elevated uh, uh, TPOs, then I'm looking at an iodine deficiency. And my suggestion for that is to go online and get a Lugol solution, L-U-G-O-L, possibly S solution. It's about 10 bucks online, it's really cheap. That's a combination of uh, uh, elemental iodine and another iodine. And, and uh, one drop of Lugol solution contains 6.25 milligrams of, uh, of, of uh, elemental iodine. And they start with one drop per day and each week they increase by one drop per day till they get up to about four drops per day. And then retest after about six weeks or so and see if their TPO is, is still elevated. Now, as far as adrenal function, um, if they have a combination of thyroid and adrenal function, I've seen that fairly commonly. And so what I would do would, would be to start out with one adrenal rebuilder and work up to four adrenal rebuilder, depending on their level of adrenal fatigue. So they take the adrenal fatigue questionnaire and say they were moderate, then they would they would work up to taking four a, a day by taking one tablet, one caplet one day for a week, and then two caplets a day for a week, and then increase it for two more weeks until they're at four caplets per day. Um, but and I would, going back, I, I would, sorry. I wouldn't leave out super adrenal stress formula in that too, uh, because you also need that, a lot of those nutrients are needed for the, for the thyroid to work uh, properly as well. And then going back to your product availability, what is the other option to get them in Canada? You can simply call our, our office at 1888 um, uh, adrenal, 1888 adrenal. Or you can write, you can email at info at icahealth.com and uh, they can send them to Canada directly. Perfect. That's, and then do that's you for practitioners. So practitioners can order it that way. Uh, patients can order it by simply going to the Adrenal Fatigue website, adrenalfatigue.org. Okay. And then do you ever recommend the use of pregnenolone or DHEA? And if so, which one and when? I recommend both at, at, at particular times. I especially when, when estrogen is high or progesterone is low, I want to make sure the progesterone cream is, is used. Um, I'll sometimes use pregnenolone before I use progesterone because it's more of the mother hormone. So I'll use it as a tablet and I'll use the I use the Allergy Research Group uh, uh, sustained release, the 150 micrograms of, uh, of a pregnenolone uh, once a day. And, if the, pre and the, pre uh, if the progesterone doesn't straighten out within a month, then I'll go to progesterone cream. Um, if I want an immediate effect of progesterone cream, I'll rub it on the wrists, on the backs of the legs, on the top of the feet, on the, on the uh, on the temples where there's no fat pad. If I'm looking for more of a long-term effect, like for example, their symptoms are worse during the last two weeks of their period, that's probably a progesterone deficiency. And, and uh, I'll use progesterone cream rubbed on the swimsuit area. And if they need it, I'll use, I'll, I'll uh, spike it with a little bit of uh, progesterone cream on the wrist or whatever to take away the, the symptoms. Also, when there's progesterone involved, I almost always make sure there's at least 400 milligrams of magnesium taken because progesterone uses a lot of magnesium with that. I'll recommend DHEA when I, I see on the blood test that their DHEA is, is low. And uh, 
I'll use sometimes I'll use combination of cortisol with DHEA in order to uh, I'll recommend if they're really really bad uh, in their have severe functioning they're almost unable to function with life I'll sometimes I don't practice anymore so I refer them to doctors that will prescribe five minute five milligrams of hydrocortisone with uh, 50 milligrams of DHEA while they're also taking the full adrenal protocol. Uh, and that will act as kind of a temporary boost to help stabilize them, but it's not gonna be a cure. It's simply a Band-Aid treatment to make them feel better. And then in the background, while the adrenal protocol is working, the person will feel better uh, for a time. So yeah, I use, all, I use those. I use many other things too. I'm not just a one trick pony. Great. <laughs> And then um, for patients who do not eat porcine for religious reasons, are you still recommending the glandular product or is there an alternative? Um, I, I asked a, uh, a Jewish rabbi about that. And he said, actually, in, in the Quran that, that it says that if the porcine product is used as a medicine, then it's allowed to be taken. And and so I said, really? I said, would you put that in writing? He says, yeah, for fifteen hundred dollars. And I didn't want to pay him fifteen hundred dollars, so I didn't do it. But anyway, he told me that indeed, for medical reasons, if it's a medicine, then it's allowed to be taken by the Jewish profession or the Jewish uh, uh, religion. I don't know about Muslims. Um, we are planning on coming out with a bovine uh, product that we've had delayed a little bit. But that's our next answer, is, is to have a bovine source for those people. OK. And then is your vitamin C product uh, buffered? Absolutely. I guess I missed that part of the lecture. But yeah, indeed. It's, but it's not buffered with a cheap bioflavin, or with a cheap bio, uh, uh, oh, I can't think of it. <laughs> it's, it it's, it's buffered with the trace minerals. So in, instead of uh, the, using the bicarbonates to balance it, which is very inexpensive, we balance it with the expensive trace minerals, mangan manganese, magnesium, uh, zinc, and copper, because those are needed by the adrenals to help uh, sequester the free radicals generated by the adrenal cascade when it's making the adrenal hormones. So they're needed by superoxide dismutase in both the cytosol and the mitochondria in order to sequester the free radicals that are generated as the adrenal fatigue, uh, as the adrenal cascade becomes more functional. So yes, it's very, it's very nicely buffered. That's why people come to us and say, this is the only vitamin C product I can take. This is the only one that doesn't burn my stomach. This is the only one that doesn't upset my stomach. Yeah, it's, it's a, a very nicely buffered. And then be a sustained release, that vitamin C isn't going to suddenly disappear in your, and, and explode in your stomach. It's going to be slowly released over about two hours. OK. And then uh, what dose of pro progesterone uh, would you recommend to rub on the temples for sleep in stage three or four of adrenal fatigue if they're not responding to uh, magnesium for insomnia? Well, first thing I would do is uh, in adrenal fatigue, I'd be taking 40 drops of herbal adrenal support formula at night. That's that's one of the first things I, I do. And then I, I'd combine that if if they want to take progesterone cream, about a dime size, of of uh, about a dime size, of a uh, from the tube, and put that on your temples, spread it around, and put it on two or three places. I find the wrists and and in the uh, in the inner part of the elbow to be some of the most convenient because there's no fat pad there. And it starts. You can start feeling it. Oh. 15 to 30 minutes afterwards, uh, up to 45 minutes before it. some people it's delayed. And this is for men and women, by the way. Okay, uh, the next question we have, um, a situation where there's a patient with uh, Gilbert syndrome and adrenal insufficiency, plus sleep apnea, central and obstructive. This patient states that when he meditates, his blood pressure goes very high, uh, as in 190 over 90. Uh, what would you suggest? When he meditates, it goes up. Yes. That's very interesting, isn't it? Maybe he's not right with God or something. I don't know. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I'm going to have to think about that for just, just a second. Could you read the question again? Sure. So a patient with Gilbert syndrome and adrenal insufficiency, sleep apnea, central and obstructive, uh, states that when he, he meditates, his blood pressure goes very high, 190 over 90. Okay. Um, let's see. Does he does he have obvious uh, liver dysfunction? And just uh, yes, Gilbert syndrome. Yeah, I mean, I'm just asking because some are almost non, uh, some some are almost asymptomatic, and others are fairly uh, demonstrative. Hmm. He's asymptomatic. He's asymptomatic. Okay. Um, There's, there's two or three things I would suggest, and I don't have any experience with this, and so this is strictly off the cuff. That um, one of the things I would suggest is, is niacin, and another is, is uh, uh, cayenne pepper, a red capsicum in a capsule. And the reason for it is both of those are vasodilators. And when we think of vasodilators, we think of, of, uh, of lowering blood pressure. Um, with a meditation, I'd be interested if he uses any breathing techniques. And and if his if his meditation is doesn't involve breathing techniques, I'd like to see what would happen if he use alternate nostril breathing with the, with uh, the beginning of his meditation to see if his blood pressure stays low. If his if his blood pressure still is elevated then he probably should switch to a different kind of meditation, like Zazen, like a walking, a walking type of meditation, a Zazen, where he simply is mindful with movement. And uh, there may be some anxiety associated with the sitting and, med and, and meditating, and walking meditation may be helpful for him. Another thing might be helpful for him is if he has running if he can have the sound of running water beside him when he's meditating to help that calmness uh, those are some things that might be helpful to him okay well i guess we'll move on to another question i, I feel like we could get into that a lot more uh if yeah. we kept going um right as, so another patient case, um, a patient has asthma since a baby and was put on a daily corticosteroid. They're now in their 70s and chronically dizzy. Um, MD tests showed low ACTH and low cortisol. Um, they were given the solution of just more corticosteroids. Uh, is there more of a natural approach, natural hormones or glandular? That's probably a, that's a tough one because he's been taking it for such a long time that the hydro that the, the the body has gotten used to that exogenous type of corticosteroid. Um, what I would suggest is is it a is it a topical corticosteroid that he's taken or is it a tablet? Does it say how many milligrams he's taken? Uh, it is oral. It's oral. Okay. Then what I would suggest. Is is that he take a, um, a saliva hormone test when he's when he's taking his regular medication, and that'll give us a baseline about what he's able to operate with. And then what I was start doing is take the adrenal fatigue protocol and see how he ranks on on the adrenal fatigue questionnaire, and start at that particular level, and take that for a minimum of three weeks, and then at the at the end of three weeks, then cut his uh, hydrocortisone down by 10% and keep up for another, in another three weeks, cut another 10%. Another three weeks, cut another percent. 
10%. And keep going and see if we can get the adrenals to, once again, start taking up the slack and start responding again, because that's his problem. The adrenals have gone to sleep, and so the, the entire HPA axis has gone to sleep, and this, and this fellow sounds like. It. And so as he's able to wake up, if the adrenals are going to wake up, I think that's the best way to wake them up. Now, other things could be used. Um, if he's is he's familiar with diathermy, that might help. Uh, simple massage over the adrenals might help. Uh, going to an acupuncturist and having him stimulate the uh, the kidney meridian that involves the adrenals uh, that might help. So there's other ancillaries. He's, we're not playing by any rule book here. There's no double blind placebo crossover studies about this. This is simply what might help. But I've had people that had been taking cortisol for a long time that were able to recover once it, uh, they started this protocol. Not everyone, but certainly it's worth a try. Perfect. And then... And, and it uh, also for the uh, asthma. Uh, I'd say use it as uh, acupuncture for the asthma too, because it'd be a great benefit for that too. Perfect. And then as far as your protocol for depression, do you modify that at all for teenagers with depression? I modify it toward the, as, as the patient needs to be modified. So that if, for example, if taking the, uh, the severe protocol, uh, they find that they're a little bit jumpy, then I decrease the amount of super adrenal stress formula because the adrenals are being overdriven. And, and you, can, you can do that, any, medica, any, any supplement can do that. So I lower that a little bit. Uh, if they are having trouble settling down, I increase herbal adrenal support formula to help them settle down. Um, I, I might, if they're having depression, I might use St. John's Wort to help with that. Uh, exercise is very important for people with depression. Mild exercise is important for depression. Uh, looking with a, with a teenage girl, I always want to look at the female hormone balances because oftentimes progesterone is low in female women. And, and we want to make sure that that progesterone is in relation with the estrogen because estrogen will suppress thyroid. And if we don't balance it with progesterone, it'll dominate the thyroid and lower the thyroid and cause depression related to thyroid. So we always have to keep the, uh, the, the young female hormone level is constantly changing. One of the things of, of a good diet and solid exercises is one of the best things we can do to help this female body straighten its hormones out and, and become normal. Those, I can't think of better therapies. Now we have to add ancillary therapies as we were talking about with these dietary supplements and often with progesterone cream. But a regular good quality food exercise, uh, food program described in my book and described on, in the lecture I just gave, uh, pardon me, along with the proper dietary supplements we just reviewed, is often the key. Uh, but the, if, if one particular extra is going to have to be given, progesterone cream is probably that one. And does that change at all if she is on birth control pills? Oh my God. Uh, yeah, have her get off the birth control pills. She's never going to balance <laughs> with birth control pills. So there, there's the copper key, there's the O-ring, there's, there's other choices, but no, she'll never balance it. She just won't balance it. I'm sorry, awesome. there is no solution for that one. If, if she's not willing to go to another, but those other kind of birth control pills are as effective as the pill. And, and so that's, uh, you know, that's, that's a good option. But no, she's on the birth control pill. Uh, it creates a false sense of pregnancy. And, and, uh, and especially she's on just uh, estrogen dominant ones. She'll never balance it. I'm, I'm sorry, there's no solution I know of. If other doctors with more wisdom than I have a solution, then I'm all for that. Please answer. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilson. I think we are out of time as far as the Q&A portion is goes, so I apologize if we didn't get to all the questions, but I believe we got to most of them. Um, is there a way to contact you, Dr. Wilson, um, if there are any questions in the future, or is there a site you can direct them to that you would recommend as a good resource? 
Uh, certainly. Well, the P2P should have a lot of uh, information on it uh, related to us. And and if you have questions, yeah, they're welcome to email me uh, at uh, drjameswilson at icahealth.com. So D-R-J-A-M-E-S-W-I-L-S-O-N at I-C-A, Indigo Charlie Alpha, health, H-E-A-L-T-H dot com. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilson. I really appreciate your time. Um, oh, thank you. And thank you for your listeners. Absolutely. You got great talks. You got great talks there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as a reminder to everyone, um, we will send out this recording tomorrow along with a PDF of the slides and uh, the handouts that he referenced throughout the presentation. So just look for that in your inbox tomorrow. Uh, and thank you again to everyone for joining us, and I hope you all have a wonderful night.